Good evening. Uh, I am uh, Dr. John Mulcahy. I'm one of the co-interim presidents of the Carnegie Institution for Science, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's speaker and tonight's program. Um, WannaCry, Locky, TrickBot, Shamoon, Wiper, some people know what these are. Uh, these words might sound like fictitious comic book villains, but in fact, uh, these are all different names for computer malware. Uh, coined in 1990, the word malware refers to a variety of forms of harmful software designed with malicious intent. Today, by some accounts, as many as 250,000 malware programs appear in the world each day. That's really incredible. Uh, it's not only the security of our personal data that's at risk here. Uh, many believe that malware, through the cyber warfare it enables, is the biggest threat to our national security. Uh, no individual is more aware of these uh, issues uh, than tonight's uh, guest speaker, Ray Rothrock. Uh, Mr. Rothrock is chairman and CEO of Red Seal, an American cybersecurity company founded in 2004. Um, he's also the author of the book we are uh, all here to launch tonight called uh, Digital Resilience. I think it's up there somewhere, yes. Uh, in which he explores the cyber threats posed by malware uh, and explains how to identify and address them. Uh, and for those of you who haven't had a chance, you can buy a copy of the book uh, outside uh, af afterwards, and, and Ray will be around to uh, sign copies of the book. So we hope you will uh, join us for that. Ballroom. A scientist by training, he received degrees in nuclear engineering from Texas A&M and MIT. Mr. Rothrock began his career with Yankee Atomic Electric. Uh, events at Three Mile Island soon diverted his nuclear path, and he headed to Silicon Valley, attracted by startups, and the venture capital world. In 1988, after receiving an MBA from Harvard, he began a 25-year career with the venture capital company Van Rock of Rockefeller fame, where he established an extraordinary track record, track record in cybersecurity investments and where he became a world expert on that topic. Uh, Mr. Rothrock is currently a member of the board of the MIT Corporation, and he serves on several of MIT's visiting committees. Uh, previously, he served uh, for a decade as MIT Visiting Committee on the Nuclear Science and Engineering Department. He also served as chairman of the, Na of the National Venture Capital Association, elected by his peers in 2012 and 2013. He has been a trustee of Texas A&M, and he has served as executive uh, in residence both at Middlebury College and at Harvard School of Business. Among his recent awards is the 2015 Distinguished Alumnus Award from Tau Beta Pi, the National Engineering Honor Society. I'll just take a minute here to just give a personal comment. Uh, last year, Ray and I had the chance of witnessing the total solar eclipse together in Idaho. Um, and once you've seen a total solar eclipse with somebody, you are personally bonded with them for life. It's such an amazing experience. <laughs> so I actually, I consider him a, a close personal friend for the rest of our lives based on that experience. Uh, if you haven't seen one of those, you need to do that. Uh, tonight, after a brief uh, presentation, Ray will be joined by renowned security expert Richard A. Clark, who, among many other things, is the former U.S. National Coordinator for Security, Infrastructure Protection, Protection and Counterterrorism. Their discussion of the future of cybersecurity will be moderated by James N. Miller, former Undersecretary of State for Policy and current senior fellow at Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Lab and Harvard University's uh, Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Uh, it should be a really incredible evening. We, I'm sure everybody will enjoy it. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in welcoming our distinguished guests. Start with Ray Rothman. Bonded forever. Wow. <laughs> I guess solar eclipses and malware kind of bond you forever. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming this evening. It's just a pleasure. There's many of my uh, cohorts from Red Seal are here, so I really appreciate that. Um, I'm uh, going to just about 15 minutes here talk about where all this came from and what it's all about. We'll bring up the slides. Um, I, it, it's a um, I, and I have to thank the Carnegie uh, for for having this and this unbelievable facility. I haven't seen it all like I'm seeing it tonight. It's just really tremendous. If you it the, it's this is like you walk in, it's like science. You know, it just feels just tremendous. So uh, I've been a very lucky guy. I think I, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, and went to a great state school, and then on to graduate school, and have just been involved in so many interesting projects at Venrock and and really started down the cybersecurity path there. 
Uh, one of the one of the things I've, I've been lucky enough, I've been involved with eight public companies, and I've been on those boards. I'm on two presently, and uh, so I kind of have a sense of the com conversation, the vocabulary, the 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 briefness that which cyber is discussed in the boardroom, and and what really sort of goes on there in terms of audits and stuff. So part of the book is is to discuss that. Uh, also, I think good VCs, good venture capitalists uh, recognize patterns, and pattern recognition is a very powerful thing. In fact, now we've got computers called machine learning things that are just doing what humans have done forever, uh, but they do it very fast. So uh, pattern recognition is a, a, a very key thing, and I want to thank Dick Clark especially for the forward in the book. Uh, he, um, I, I think I've come at the whole cyber threat as, from a technology point of view. He comes at it from the threat point of view. And we, we've had a lot of discussions over the years about where we are in the world. And just to use a baseball analogy, we're kind of in the top of the second inning. We got a lot more innings to play here and we're not winning. So um, I wrote this book uh, for everyone, everyone that's here, academics, professionals, students, in fact, uh, We've got uh, Matt Ross, you're here somewhere. We've got a high school student in the room there in the back. So this is, this is a common topic that a lot of people are talking about. We're in the headlines all the time. So let me get my clicker here. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, I, I worry about uh, in our society, our society which is so based on trust, is that confidence may be getting knocked around and slipping a little bit with all the cyber news. The news media does a great job of, of putting it up and and we just, we, just, we just have to change what we're doing. It, it, you may recall that old cliche, right? Uh, uh, to keep doing things the same way and expect a different result. Well, that's kind of where we are in cyber. And so I think we need to do a, uh, something differently. So how many people think we're winning this cyber war? Good answer. Oh, well, there was one answer. Says where we are. Well, we are and we aren't. Um, it, it turns out, uh, you know, it's sort of how you define it. So a cyber attack... You know, this is when uh, clandestine activities occur, malware gets into your network somehow and does nefarious things, steals your data, uh, causes steel mills to melt down, um, centrifuges to go offline, all kinds of interesting things. Uh, they come in all shapes and sizes, and uh, I thought, uh, are we winning? So I would say we're not, and history suggests we're not. So I've been involved in technology uh, pretty much for the last three decades. And in the early days, we had antivirus, and there was a handful of attacks. These are orders of magnitude on the left. And it was mostly disruption. You might remember floppy disk, and you went from, to, from computer to computer. But antivirus was very effective, about 2 million. This is, a, this is a big business today. About a $15 billion of revenue is generated in the antivirus. But it worked. It worked for a while. And then the internet comes along, and we start connecting everything together. And these connections allow me to get to you over the wire instead of over a floppy disk. Well, this was actually, now we did some interesting things. Spyware, we had uh, keyboard trackers so they could track your keyboard things. They could see where you go. I uh, actually invested in one company that... Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh, that's malware. Uh, <laughs> good. I think you're... I'll get it on here. Sorry about that. I guess I moved my arms too much. I would do that. Um, anyway, uh, they were connected, and you know the spyware. We could we could watch what you were doing. And I had invested in one company once that actually uh, sent me a photograph and took over my computer and played back to me what I'd just done. It was incredible. This is a long time ago. So and we had bots. Well, now what's happening? We have APTs, Advanced Persistent Threats. This is what FireEye and a lot of other companies have tried to be. But the bottom line is, it's not working. We're losing. They walk right through the front door. They are uh, they come in through the web or they come through your email. Um, I don't think I have this right. Uh, and so we're not winning. And uh, this is just getting worse. And our, in the last 10 years, our entire society... There it is. Turn it over. Thank you, my wife. Thank you. <laughs> I need some coaching occasionally. Um, anyway, so we're we're not winning, and this stuff is. Getting, and also, in the last decade or so, our our world has just become prolifically networked. I mean, the the smartphone, the iPhone that Apple invented was 2007, only 11 years ago. So, uh, the problem is getting worse, not better. And so, we have to do something very different. 
So uh, for me, two, 2013, I retired from Vinrock in, in 2012, 2013, and uh, the Target event happened in Q4. You may remember this event. This is when uh, uh, a, a, a normal human being showed up at Target to hook their computer into the HVAC system to make some adjustments to the air conditioning there at headquarters. That person, unbeknownst to them, brought malware into the uh, Target environment, and that malware found its way out to the point of sales. Now that was a, you know, Target is a Fortune 50 company, very sophisticated, lots of money, lots of engineers, lots of products, all good. Uh, how did this happen? What, what, what went on? It, um, it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't for uh, lack of Target's ability to deal with it, but they were hacked and they were hacked badly and over Christmas, 40 million, I think, uh, credit card numbers were stolen. And that's sort of what, that was an aha moment for me. It's like, wow, how does a big company like that, who's bought all the products I've invested in for 25 years, have a problem? And of course, just in the last month or two, our intelligence agencies have revealed that the Russians are sitting on our grid and other control points in the electric system. So it's there, folks, and, and we have to worry about it. And, and you may remember Estonia, when uh, they shut down the grid there, actually the Russians demonstrated they could control things. So another thing happened. Uh, the hacker is already inside. This was, this was revealed through a lot of studies. Verizon publishes a report. In fact, the statistic is that 95% of all the successful malware attacks that actually exfiltrate data and you lose start with a phishing. Everybody know what phishing is? Spelled P-H-I-N-G. Uh, does anybody know when the first, at least in my research, first recorded phishing attack occurred? Benjamin Franklin did it in 1776 with the French, and it works. Uh, it's to get you to do something you would normally do in the course of your everyday life, whether it's to send money or open a door or unlock your house or turn off your burglar alarm, whatever it is. 95% of all the successful attacks. So sophisticated companies under attack, you and I, frail human beings, fall vulnerable to this stuff. It's not a good scene. And what does it cost us? There's a lot of estimates. Forbes put out a report. I, I track these things occasionally. It's, the estimate is be about two trillion dollars next year. Two trillion dollars. What's the U.S. economy? About twenty trillion. So ten percent of the U.S. economy, ten percent, not one percent, ten percent of the U.S. economy will be lost dollars-wise. And that doesn't include the trillion dollars of intellectual property that has been stolen, unfortunately, mostly by the Chinese. This is all documented. I, I'm not making this stuff up. So uh, uh, the, the other part about, uh, oh, and uh, just to, to say it, it, really what happens to these businesses is that trust and confidence uh, get hit every time one of these things happen. Now, it's interesting. So I, I believe, and part of the reason why I wrote the book was that cyber is now a business issue. And I was so glad to hear last week when Warren Buffett brought this up in his annual meeting, and he said cybersecurity is a bigger existential threat than nuclear war. He said this to his shareholders. So um, I hope I'm making my case. So um, pattern recognition suggested that new thinking was needed. And uh, through reading some books, one uh, that Jim actually participated with with some work he did uh, called Beyond Cybersecurity had suggested some ideas and out of that emerged this thing called resilience. And then I read a book by Judith Roden. Judith, uh, she was the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. This book is pretty famous. It's a good one to read. It's called The Resilience Dividend. It's like being strong in a world where things go wrong. That is what cyber is. We got to be strong in a world that's going wrong until we get control of it. And she talked about actually resilient cities, but the translation to the cyber world is exactly right. She's talking about the physical world. I'm talking about the cyber world. So, okay, thanks. Um, in, uh, in my, all my years of venture capital, I saw about 10,000 presentations, and the best ones were presentations where people could bring something from real life into whatever they were trying to convince us to invest in, because some of these things are very hard to understand, some of these new technologies, new problems. So the, the one that really comes to mind when I think about resilience is the human body. The human body, think about this thing. The human body's got skin. That's a firewall. Nothing gets through. I can blow a hole in it. I can take a sharp object and poke a hole. It's got ports, port 80, port 443, all this sort of stuff to let things in and out. I breathe, you know. Um, I've got these things called the white blood cells. 
which attack intrusions. I've got these things called red blood cells, which clog the holes. These concepts exist in the cyber world. So uh, I think the human body is a very good example. The human body also has uh, you know, evolution and a few other processes going on, but it's not just technology. And so resilience really turns out to be a strategy. The human body is a resilient strategy machine, I think. It's got processes, it's got a people, it's got technology. The people here for the human body would be we take drugs to prevent sicknesses, vaccinations, or if we get sick, we can do things. The technology is all the stuff I just talked about, and the processes is how all that relates to itself. So resilience really comes in this package. The other, the other thing I say about resilience is we've actually done this a lot in our modern life. Uh, this is a, an old building by uh, standards around Washington, but uh, it's very resilient. It has a fire prevention system. It has a fire detection system. It has a gas detection system. It has fresh air. It has all the things that we need. Do we ever expect this building to catch on fire? No. But the systems are there, and they're checked, and they had to be checked. It's so one thing we don't have in the cyber world are these checks. We don't have compliance requirements. We don't have standards. Okay. Um, so uh, what's a cyber network? It's, it's data. It's network is an infrastructure. Infrastructure is like electricity. But data lives in places, and it gets from point A to point B over a pathway. We don't think about that very often. Everybody's focused. We've got to save the data. We've got to encrypt the data. Yeah, you've got to do all that. But you've also got to know where stuff is going. And systems weren't built with resilience in mind. Think about it. The Internet came along in the, uh, the commercial Internet in like 1991, 2 or 3. It was built very fast. In the last 10 years, it has literally exploded by orders of magnitude. People were building this stuff to make sure the email flowed. They weren't thinking about security. So I think the path to security, and I detail a fair bit of this in the book, is you've got to understand what you have, what your assets are, where your data lives, what the vulnerabilities are, and you have to have visibility to see it all. You know, if, the, if a, a large skyscraper caught on fire and the fire department rolls up, bef before they get out of the truck, they know where the fire is, who's there, what floor, what systems are engaged before they ever set foot. We don't have that kind of capability in cyber, but we can. We need to measure. Every boardroom I've ever been in only cares about the numbers. Did the revenue go up? Did the revenue go down? Did the margins get better? The mar How many people do we have? All those sorts of things. For 25 years, I invested in cyber, and no one ever brought me a deal that said, I'm going to grade your network. I'm going to measure your network and give you a score. Yet we use scores all the time. Compliance, very big deal. We have compliance all through our life, except cyber. And then if, if you got all this right and you have an intrusion or a, an attack, you can deal with it very quickly. Most people think we're okay. We do surveys every year at Red Seal, and CEOs who think they do, they really don't. Every time my company goes into the field to a client, and we run a little test, we find things they didn't know they had. We find problems that they didn't know they had. We, we do suffer a little bit from the notion of uh, we do tell them how, how ugly their baby is occasionally, and we have to be careful. But it's very important because data does move on a pathway. The data pathways are programmed by human beings and routers, and then you don't know what every path is. So we have a score. It's like a FICO score, and there's a lot of scores out there now, two years later. I'm just, this isn't a promotion. I'm just trying to tell you how important measurement is. So if you went down to the bank to borrow, went down to a car dealership to uh, buy a car and you sat down with the finance guy, he would run a FICO score on you. And if it came up 726, he'd give you the loan real fast. If it came up 400, you might have a conversation. You might have to pay more because it's more risky. So we have, we've come up with these ideas. We, 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 we three big areas, vulnerabilities, configuration information, and pathways. We, we didn't make this up. Experts like the uh, Center for Internet Security, or the SANS Institute, these people have been thinking about this a long time. So we tried to put all that knowledge and wisdom into a score and give it to you, the CEO or the board member or the CEO, whoever's running things. Because with numbers, you can know if it's getting better, you can know if it's getting worse. Very important. So you've done all that. You've got the visibility. You've got your measurements. You're in compliance. You're attacked. Turns out, most people don't respond very fast. And as you can see here, time is your enemy. Uh, you can have devastating uh, impact on your business if, it, if it's years. Yahoo was years in the making with two giant attacks. Equifax, they don't know how long it was under attack, but they stole 146 million records. That takes time. Wells Fargo, Sony Pictures, others. So time is our enemy, and that's called the being prepared part and the process part. Whoops. Uh, 
Uh, I think I, yeah, sorry, I skipped one. Uh, so the accelerator, you know, there's much to do when you're under attack. Imagine, right? You're in a burning building. How do you get out? You don't feel the same. You're not acting normal. Uh, so time is against you. And you've got to do all these things when you're under attack. You've got to figure out where it is. You've got to figure out what your options are. Someone has to call the lawyers to start the conversation about risk. Someone calls the insurance company to tell them. It's just it's a very complicated process. Nobody's really thought this through. There are a few companies that are very good at this. But this is a very big deal. And this is why resilience matters. And every problem, it is not a straight path. This is why resilience is important. Resilience assumes you don't know. You don't know what the malware is even, perhaps. You just know it's there and it's doing bad things. So you may not be able to know where it's going to go specifically because you don't know it, but you're prepared for wherever it does go. And it's a crazy path through your organization. But it takes processes, technology, and people are always involved. So I think we can do this. Uh, we must do it better with a strategy that starts at the top of the organization. Uh, this is what Dick has spent the last 15 years working with lots of corporations about their whole strategy, about how they prepare for such things. Uh, people, process, and technology. It starts in the C-suite. Just yesterday, Axios uh, Codebook published an article that the CISO of Equifax, in order to take the job, required that he reported to the CEO. Usually, the, 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 the security guy doesn't report to the CEO. But I thought it was interesting that he insisted that he do. I think that's really smart. So. Uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, the presentation about why resilience matters and why it's the top of the second inning and not the end of the game. But some big takeaways from the book, I'll just run through these real quickly. Cyber has always been a technology problem, stuck by some security engineer down in the IT organization that never saw the light of day. That's a mistake. It's a business issue now. It's not a technology issue. We've got to talk about it like that. You've got to ask yourself, what can go wrong? That's the most important thing in any strategy. What can go wrong? What can I be prepared for? Um, uh, the, the target cash registers, for example. So you can say, well, didn't they have good engineering on the cash registers? Yeah, they had great engineering. They actually thought about cyber attacks, except one thing. They left the data in the cache memory of the machine. So it wasn't on the hard drives, because they knew they couldn't do that and stay within the law of PCI. It was sitting in the cache of the memory of the cache registers, and that's where the malware got to. So, it, you know, you just can't. So what could go wrong? They should have thought of that. Uh, basic cyber training for everyone. Everyone here ever had a phishing test? You, do you have a phishing test? Yeah. Good. Do more. Uh, really share the truth about visibility. Look, these things are complicated, and some of them are pretty ugly, but it is what it is, and we just have to get it out there. Put an expert at the table. This is hard for a lot of people. There's not a lot of experts in the world. And I'm not making a bid for more board seats. But um, you need experts at the table. And then you need to measure stuff. Boards love numbers. They love to be measured. And it's a very important thing. So preparation is key to, to strategy. And that's the essence of my talk. Thank you very much. So I'd like to ask Jim and Dick to come up. We're going to have a QA and a a conversation. And then there's microphones on either side here. So if you have a question for for any of us, uh, I feel very honored to have both of these guys here. They know more about this world and the issues that there are. My vision, by the way, is that it gets off the headlines in the newspaper and that everybody buys Red Seal. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Ray, that's terrific. Thank you very much. Um, we want to have a conversation spanning from the business context to government and, and, and international as well. Let me start by asking a question of you that goes from the large business that you really focus the book on to small businesses. And um, it, one can see some of your recommendations applicable to small businesses, but I want to ask for those who have, you know, whether it's a small LLC where you've got three employees of me, myself, and I, or another small company, but that doesn't fit into the large business, large organization. And I want to say, I think I've got it pretty good. Uh, I've got my own server in the basement. <laughs> I use only simple passwords. I use the same one for everything. Good. I'm using Windows N NT because I've gotten used to that over time, and I think that works well. And people keep sending me these things called updates, but it seems like a risky thing to do, so I don't do that. I just want to be sure I'm on the right track and see if you have any additional <laughs> advice as well. <laughs> uh, so for small business... sound like a lot of my customers. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, no. Well, small businesses is tough, right? Because... Uh, they can't afford sophisticated engineering, and, and these products are not cheap, and they're hard to implement. And most corporations have 50 or 60 different cyber products, 
and every sort of cyber professional operates eight, nine, or ten of them. Mm -hmm. So they're they're hop they're hopping from fire to fire to fire in these places. So small companies are not going to do that, and they can't do that. But there are businesses popping up now everywhere, uh, managed service providers that do a lot of security saying one deal I invested in called Cloudflare is growing like weeds uh, where you just route all your traffic through them and they do all the cleanup they look at everything they reject the bad stuff they notify you if there's a problem uh, we use it at Red Seal in fact it's a first mm -hmm. our first line of defense is when our traffic gets to us it has been cleaned it's not perfect mm -hmm. but it's a place to start uh, you should definitely change your passwords I can't convince you to upgrade your software because it may break something but you really should change your passwords. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. that. That's number one. And just be aware of phishing, right? Notice when something looks looks fishy, it probably is. And just you mm -hmm. know, I always say, people say, "Oh, but it, it's a it's a message from the CEO. I need to respond." No, if you don't think it is, just delete it. Mm -hmm. If the CEO needs you, they'll call. That's just <laughs> <laughs> it's the way it is. Well, let me let me add the. Add the um Within the Department of Defense where I worked, uh, if you're sent a link, it's disabled, right? Uh, if I'm sent a link today, I'll call the person who supposedly sent it and ask, "Did you send me a link?" And don't do that again, first of all. Uh, but then there's a quite, then you can go to the website, of course. And we won't spend a we won't dive yeah. deep on this, but I think uh, I, I do think you know. In reading this excellent book, a lot of the principles are applicable even with less or fewer resources. Let me jump to the other other sure. end and ask uh, both you and Dick to come in on this. Uh, so then uh, you, th uh, you argued that we're losing the war, and I think that that's true at the, not just at the corporate level, but currently at the national level as well. Um, you mentioned the, the reports, uh, including a recent FBI DHS report, saying that um, Russia had a presence with, with uh, black energy and HAVX on the, on the grid. Um, what are the two or three most important things that you think we need to do uh, to make better progress as a nation? And we'll, we'll after you give a response, I want to come to, to, to Dick on that question as well and talk a little also about organization of the government. Wow. Uh, as a nation, that's a big order. Um, I, I uh, occasionally do get invited to talk to lawmakers and stuff. I, I think we need some some real compliance requirements. And uh, I don't think penalties work. You know, in, the, in, uh, in corporations, a lot of people view cyberware as, as grudge buy. You know, I, I have to buy it. Well, that's too bad. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we should have some new rules and compliances. I think the US government is well ahead of the private sector in terms of compliance and, and requirements. And, and you can do it through tax policy, for example, if you want some favors or some better tax things. You can also... Um, uh, relationships is, uh, outside of the country, uh, uh, you can do tr favorable trade things uh, to get people to encourage them to have higher standard cyber mm -hmm. things. But I think it's really about compliance. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. I would start with requiring you to identify your assets and to be able to prove that you can protect those assets. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's a big law, but anyway, Dick's. That's great. He's snarking well, over here. Let me also note I, I, I don't know if it's allowed to plug another book, but. Please do. Dick has a terrific <laughs> book called Warnings, and it. And, what it does is go through a number of instances and look at um, uh, individuals who have, who have played the role of Cassandra and provides a, a framework and, a, and indeed a score in a sense for that. You uh, have a pretty high Cass Cassandra index for cyber. <laughs> Could you speak to that for the nation and what you think uh, some of the most important steps we should take should be? Well, there's a long list uh, of things we should do. But I think the most fundamental thing we need to do is educate a workforce. We have, uh, there are various estimates, a minimum of 200,000 job openings in this country. Um, positions that require trained cyber experts to defend companies and to defend government agencies that are empty positions. Many of the positions that are full, that have someone in them, has, are occupied by people who are unqualified. Uh, we, for all the technology in the world, uh, we need qualified people to make it work. We have not yet invented the technology, even Red Seal, uh, where we can just plug in the technology and have it protect a network. Uh, people have to do that. People have to architect the networks. People have to monitor the networks. People have to respond. Uh, and you have to be trained to do that. It's not easy. Uh, it is now uh, something that you probably need a master's in information security to do it right. 
uh, and then three or four years of experience on, uh, on the network. We don't have that. And we are not turning those people out rapidly enough. Um, other countries are. Uh, China, in particular, uh, is doing that. Uh, we're not. And we're never going to be able to win the war, uh, however we define that, uh, until we address the workforce problem. That's not a technical solution. It's a policy solution. Uh, we need to get people incentivized to go into this field. And if that means the government needs to pay for their education, I know that's a shock and horror in a world where <coughs> the government seems to think we all have need to have student debt until we're 80 years old. Um, but if it means that we have to f provide everybody full scholarships to do that, then we should do that. That would be a good investment as a country. That's terrific, Dick. Um, let me follow up with you. So and people, people, technology. And technology. Yeah. And perhaps also process, process from what yeah. I understand. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, let me follow up on a, on a slightly different tack, but certainly related. You've spent uh, decades in government, 15 plus years in the private sector. You've seen the relationship from both sides. Um, uh, what's working, what's not working? Uh, and, uh, and what would, are there opportunities, you know, where you, whichever hat you like, uh, uh, where are the best opportunities to take, to take next substantial steps in private sector and government uh, partnership? Well, I think Ray talked about, Ray didn't use the, the word, the R word. Um, there's a word in Washington that begins with R that is treated like a four-letter word, but it has more letters, um, and that's regulation. Uh, Ray talked about it without, Ray's answer to your question was regulation, <laughs> just to be clear. Um, but he didn't use the word regulation. I think we need to recognize that government regulation is not usually a good idea. Um, but when we have market failure, uh, when the system, uh, the private sector system, the invisible hand, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. <coughs> when that fails, uh, the government needs to step in and, and likely nudge, uh, as Cass Sunstein says, uh, mm -hmm. nudge or, God forbid, regulate. Um, I think the government has been reluctant to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. I know every time I tried it, I got my hand slapped. Um, but we do need uh, to require certain minimal things to be done by companies, uh, and we need some sort of audit uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that happens. And beginning with a few of the critical <coughs> infrastructures, like the power grid. Mm -hmm. uh, we have defaulted in the power grid to letting the industry regulate itself. Uh, and uh, the fact that there are Russian bots <coughs> on the power grid may suggest that's not working. Um, I want to um, come back to you, Ray, on this question of, of uh, public-private and also on regulation. As, as somebody who's lived in the, in fact, been a leader in the VC world, regulation does sound probably like a, a I didn't say it, did I? Sounds yeah, like a okay, four-letter yeah. word. Um, uh, the, the government and many companies now adopting the, the NIST framework, as you know, uh, in terms of the uh, be able to explain the steps that they're taking, and there are various levels there. Yeah. Um, still, it's uh, uh, predominantly uh, for the even for the most critical of our critical infrastructure. Still, predominantly uh, voluntary. What are your thoughts about what can be done to to take the next step? Well, I, I from the from the government point, of view, the, the government collects a lot of threat information. Mm -hmm. and that ought to be made available. Uh, I don't know how you make it available, but it ought to be made available. We ought to know where the threats are coming from. We ought to know how to respond to that. And our systems ought to be smart enough mm -hmm. to adapt to those threats as they're, as they're revealed. So I think, I think that's mm -hmm. one thing. I think in the compliance regulation area, whatever you want to call it, the I, I hope we don't have a big, heavy, invisible hand. I would hate to no. see a big company fall. I know you don't mean that, but... Um, you know, we burned down a lot of buildings before we put sprinkler systems in, and I hope that we are smart enough and can invest the time. One of the problems with the losses that we're having right now is we don't get to use that money. That money gets stolen. We don't get to use that money for our own R&D, whether it be mm -hmm. cyber or other better products. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's actually the great sucking sound of R&D is going out mm -hmm. on the money side as well as the intellectual property. So it's mm -hmm. a double whammy. Mm -hmm. So I, I, somehow we have to uh, uh, either create... Uh, a relationship with those 
organizations and people that are stealing the money or whatever. We, we, we have to we have to confront them and and put it on the table that you're stealing this or you're whatever and mm -hmm. and have a world court a world capability to bring that to power right i we have to have a place to adjudicate these problems otherwise mm -hmm. you know the burglars just you wouldn't have a burglar sit in your house and waiting for you to leave but that's what we've got <laughs> mm -hmm. in cyber why isn't it why isn't it war already so but. so on, on that topic just a just a note that um over the course of several administrations, there have been sometimes significant efforts to improve sharing information, including classified information between, from the government to the private sector. Uh, on the classified side, it's uh, typically been to a small number of large companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and often, and I hate to say this uh, because it, it took a lot of effort to do it at all, but often later than we would have liked. Uh, I think your, your point is, is, tr is spot on, though, uh, in terms of where, where there's a potential uh, low-hanging fruit. Um, your book talks a lot about governance. Um, <clears throat> there's been discussion of governance in this, uh, with respect to cyber in this town, as you know, recently as, the, as Rob Joyce uh, departed the White House. Right. Uh, I don't understand, uh, and I understand he's not uh, to be uh, replaced, at least under current plans. You can c comment on that or not if you like, but could you speak a little bit about the key principles of governance and what you think those that you think ought to apply to our government as well as to uh, critical infrastructure and other other uh, private companies. Yeah, I, I guess I'll I'll be careful, but it it seems that cyber isn't being acknowledged as a threat, and that we're going back to bombs and bullets. There are people who advocate, like in the power system, to turning off all the digital systems and going back to analog switches. For God's sakes, mm -hmm. these these are crazy ideas. We're not you're not going to turn back the hand of time. So I don't know what is going on there. I think from a governance point of view, in every organization I've been involved with, and it's been 53 private companies I've financed, I mean, it, the CEO drives a lot. Uh, the CEO is the culture of the company, the honesty, mm -hmm. the transparency, the sometimes the innovation mm -hmm. in the company. Mm -hmm. uh, so it starts at the very top. And so long as the people who are in charge of defending or keeping us mm -hmm. safe in the cyber world are sort of pushed down into that dark corner of the IT department, I think, it's a huge mistake. So there's a governance mm -hmm. piece here that's required. I think the SEC, you have one other thing mm -hmm. I forgot to mention. One, the SEC could play a big role here in public companies. Big mm -hmm. role. Mm -hmm. Why haven't they? What's the holdback? I, you know, look, uh, everyone's complaining about, you know, uh, double authentication, it, all this sort of, too bad. You know, it mm -hmm. should be in place and we should be required to do it and we'll get used to it just mm -hmm. like we've learned mm -hmm. to get used to other things mm -hmm. in life. Mm -hmm. Uh, my dad used to say that locks just keep honest people honest. You're not going to keep the bad guys out, really, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you sure can keep most people out. Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. I think uh, I think there are levers. I think the governance starts, and the SEC, by the way, dictates <laughs> a lot of policy mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. public companies. Mm -hmm. So the governance could start there as well. That's a great answer, uh, Dick. You were the lead for cyber for uh, uh, for critical infrastructure protection. Your views on governance and what we can what we can do to to uh, you can comment on the cyber coordinator job if you like, but um, I'd like you to comment more broadly on, on governance and how the U.S. government in particular could operate more effectively on this issue. Oh, do we have a few hours? <laughs> <laughs> um, the U.S. government is, is not organized to deal with this issue. Uh, it's, it's diffused throughout many different departments and agencies. Uh, we expect every department to be able to handle its own cybersecurity. Uh, there's a little government agency you may have heard of called the Office of Personnel Management. It's a little agency compared to most departments. Uh, and it, like all other agencies, was told to defend itself. Uh, it couldn't. As a result, my, uh, all the details of my life are now in the file in Beijing. Uh, along with those of anybody else who ever had the top secret security clearance because the Chinese came into OPM and took all of our files. Um, it's crazy to think that each agency should be in charge of its own security. We ought to have a cybersecurity agency. You ought to do it for most of the federal government. The Defense Department can do it for itself, but everybody else ought to be defended by a cybersecurity agency. A cabinet level? Uh, no, I don't think it needs to be cabinet okay. level. Okay. Um, but it would be nice if there were someone in the White House who were in charge of cyber policy. Uh, I was the first one to do that. 
Uh, I was followed by a number of good people. Uh, and as you mentioned, the last guy to do it, uh, Rob Joyce, very highly qualified uh, career civil servant, um, has been shown the door at the White House and is not going to be replaced. Also at the State Department, the Office of Cyber Policy that was in charge of working with other countries to get cooperation, because we desperately need other countries' cooperation if we're going to solve this problem. Most of the hacks originate overseas. Uh, the State Department Office of Cyber Coordination has also been abolished in the last year. Um, now, I suppose if you got elected based on hacking, you think it's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, but, but we really, we really can't leave the country defenseless against hacking uh, without suffering an enormous price. Um, I'm going to have a hard Let's time. Let's move to a cheerier <laughs> subject, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> I want to turn to technology for a moment and just ask a, a couple more questions. But before I do so, I want to let people know that um, there are two microphones one in each aisle. If you would like to ask a question, please go ahead and make your way to one of those microphones and we will go uh, in the order uh, that people appear at the microphone and I will ask that you actually ask a question and ask that you, uh, uh, before <laughs> we're, doing we're so... We're only allowed to pontificate. <laughs> <laughs> ask that you identify yourself uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and make the question something that, can, uh, that you can get out in one or two breaths at most. So I, I have a couple more quick, quick questions, relatively, relatively broad. Um, um, we've talked about, the, 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 to some degree, the people and process side. And, and obviously, the technology, as you pointed out, is changing rapidly. Um, you don't expect a silver bullet. Um, no. At the same time, you're, you've invested in companies that are helping, and, and you run one now, that are helping to provide not just uh, new processes and, and clever people, but new products as well. Um, so two-part question, all right? Part one, do you see the mix between technology and people shifting? I would posit that the more we shift, uh, including through AI, the better we're likely to do. Uh, we talk about spear phishing attacks. When you do a test on spear phishing, the first time you do it, um, uh, you, 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 people have like a 40-ish percent click rate. The second time, under 20%. 1% still too high, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and so forth. So that's, let's stop, let, let, let me just uh, do part one first. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and, and Dick's as well. Yeah, AI, these new technologies are very important. I, I, you know, how they actually manifest themselves in something that we understand or use I, is probably not gonna happen. It's probably buried deep somehow. But surely we can analyze the bits coming through. We find intrusion detections in the packets all the time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we'll just get better and better at it. Uh, so that there, there will definitely be a thing, mm -hmm. I, you know. To, to Dick's point about a lack of people, uh, shifting that way doesn't sound like a real smart thing to do right now. So we actually need more mm -hmm. capable investments uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. There. The mm -hmm. other thing I think is technology is interesting. There are fifteen hundred U.S. startups, private startups in cyber. There are five hundred in Israel. So there are mm -hmm. two thousand startups. Mm -hmm. I don't know five, ten billion dollars of capital all in. And t that's too many. So there's got to be some consolidation that's going to go on. And so mm -hmm. in the meantime, all these corporations are inundated and they're confused. So there's, we're right now in this sort of fuzzy mm -hmm. time and mm -hmm. maybe something will emerge. I think getting control of your user space, your network space, your endpoint space is like job one. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. from a technology. So I'm actually still on the technology uh, bandwagon. Mm -hmm. It's been very good to me, so I'm going to stick with good, it a little longer. Good. Yeah. Let me ask Dick for your comments on, on well, that. Well, you know, I had a hope that artificial intelligence, neural networks, machine learning um, would make it easier to defend networks. Mm -hmm. um, and it hasn't yet, really, um, because yeah. people aren't implementing it properly and we're not there yet technologically. But what hadn't occurred to me is that you can use it offensively as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And so whenever you see a breakthrough in technology um, that we think might be a silver bullet, uh, realize that it has the potential for being flipped uh, mm -hmm. and used against us as well. A very good point. Let's go ahead to the, yeah, to sure. the audience. Got a lot of people. Yeah, yeah great. Uh, gentleman at the, at the microphone on our, on our left, please. 
Yeah, hi, I'm Alan. I'm with the National Institute for Standards and Technology, uh, U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, I, I do have a question, but I have a very quick comment first. Um, uh, the, the grid actually is under uh, federal regulation called the NERC SIP, the Critical Infrastructure Protection. So there are regulations. Um, you know, the, the NERC enforcement is questionable at this time. And, you know, of course, we, we always make the biggest progress whenever there's a big outage. So yeah. as soon as there's mm -hmm. a cyber outage, yeah, we're going to we'll, we'll jump in. That's just historically the way the grid works. My mm -hmm. question is, um, uh, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the, uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework. Mm -hmm. but my question is, do you believe that's an effective set of documents? And if not, what can we do to, to uh, do a better mm -hmm. job of that? So uh, I, I consult with a lot of for a lot of companies and a lot of boards. As Ray said, the boards of, of companies want numbers. Uh, they want something that's simple to understand, uh, and even if it reflects complexity. And the NIST standard is what I use um, to, to say to companies, here's a internationally accepted framework where you can see where your company fits, uh, and you can also have a target for where you want to go to, how you want to improve. So uh, I think it's a very useful tool. I would quibble with you uh, on the federal regulation <coughs> of the electric power grid. The NERC is an industry association. Uh, and so the industry association came up with its own regulations in order to forestall federal regulation. Uh, I would still like to see the federal government, the FERC, which is the federal government, uh, doing inspections and penalizing people much more often uh, for violations of the standards. Thank you. Thank you. Over on the side. Just oh, real quick, sorry, I'll just so when the framework came out from NIST, we at Red Seal uh, took it very fast, compared our capabilities against that NIST. What I think some of it's missing is this quantitative. Is it better once you do something and which in the prioritization, I, I haven't quite figured it out, but that's, that, that's just a detail. Great. Um, and let me say that it came out when I was still in government. I thought and still believe it's very helpful. Yeah. But agree with both of the, both of the comments. Uh, over to our right. Hi. I'm a middle schooler at St. Patrick's. My name is Alex. And I was just wondering why so much money is invested in developing advanced malware, zero-day malware like Stuxnet and by the CA, but respectively so little is invested in advanced cybersecurity networks and why that is. Thank you. Wow. You're in junior high school? Yeah. Wow. St. Patrick's, though. <laughs> yeah. It's a special school, right? Yeah. Uh, debatably. And uh, um, remember, child labor laws here. Well, <laughs> I don't know how much was invested in the, the first part of your question, but venture capital puts in about 4 to $5 billion a year, uh, private capital, into startups and stuff. Uh, I, the R&D budget of Symantec and stuff, it's usually 2 or 3%, maybe 4%. So large successful cyber companies are not, it's not 20% or 15%, it's usually middle single digit sort of percentages and that turns, that's probably uh, 90 or $100 million. So I don't know what it takes to, to make the malware, but the countries invest, the private sector and the public companies are investing billions of dollars in this problem. Uh, I, I think the problem is, and your question alludes to it, uh, th this offense defense problem in cyberspace is a case of what we call offense preference, meaning it's a lot cheaper to be on the offense uh, than it is to be on the defense. It takes almost nothing for some of these people to uh, come up with the malware. Uh, and it takes hundreds of billions of dollars to defend against it. Uh, if you think of the big bank, JP Morgan, uh, had a problem about two years ago now. The malware that got into J.P. Morgan, you know, if you want to put a price on what it took to develop that, it's probably in the hundreds of dollars. Um, J.P. Morgan is now spending billions a year trying to defend the network because of that kind of attack. It's a great question. Yeah. Um, I'd just add is one of the reasons it's, it's more challenging to defend is that um, you've got to defend essentially the entire, not just perimeter, but also once there's entry, the interior of your network and data space, yeah. and the attacker's got to find yeah. one exploit, one and, vulnerability and if you're a to get like, in and move horizontally. 
And if you're a target yeah. like the New York Stock Exchange, they get about a half yeah. a trillion attacks a day, a half a trillion yeah, a day. Yeah, yeah. And 30 or 40 get through, and they have to worry about the 30 or 40. Yeah. So yeah. you just need to get through once and remain undetected to yeah. create yeah. problems. Terrific question. Thank you. Over on the side. I'm Carolyn. I'm one of those tiny little businesses. Um, yeah. I yeah. am in emergency and disaster management, and I'm also mm. an ISO 9000 and 14000 auditor, although there's no money in that, so I prepare people for audits. Um, you were talking about the NIST standard. Um, all along I've been thinking, with these other standards, they are scalable, they are very flexible, and in Europe especially, you cannot deal with the government unless you meet these standards. And that's true of all of our uh, car companies too. Their supply chain has to meet the ISO 9000 standards. Is there anything, is NIST anywhere near that? Is there anything out there that's going in that direction? Because that's what I need to look at for my own company, because right now I'm relying on Bitdefender. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Todd. Well, this, this standard can be applied to uh, any company at any size. It's, it's like the British standard. Uh, it's an international standard. But if you're a small company, uh, I, would, I would say this. Don't try to boil the ocean. Don't try to defend yourself against uh, you know, the Chinese People's Liberation Army attack unit. Uh, you will fail. Um, Ask yourself instead, what's, as Ray had on the slide, what could go wrong? Ask Ray's question, what could go wrong? What do you care about? You know, I got a message yesterday from Facebook <clears throat> saying, it's initially a shocking thing when you get this message, you, your Facebook account has been targeted by a foreign government. Uh, ooh. <laughs> and then I thought, it's a public account. You know, you can all go home and attack it. You know, feel free. Um, <laughs> so I think you really need to understand what, what you're trying to do, yeah. uh, what you're trying to prevent from happening, and what you're trying to protect. And that, in my experience, is different for every company, is different for every person. It comes back to a personal or a corporate risk appetite. What is your risk appetite? Do you care uh, if they read your emails? Mm -hmm. In that case, encrypt your emails. Uh, do you care if they see your browser history? In that case, go into the browser and change the settings so it doesn't maintain history. Mm -hmm. What is it that you are afraid of? Figure that out. Um, if, if you don't want them to know your banking history or you don't want them to have your banking passwords, Maybe don't bank online. So this gets to the, what you're talking about here is a risk, threat, and vulnerability analysis right. situation. And I'm also thinking about my clients and overlaying cybersecurity onto their process flow structure and their infrastructure. And right, it, it was hard enough to integrate environment and quality. And now you're mm -hmm. adding cyber and emergency management standards which also exist and I haven't seen a robust uh, cybersecurity standard that can help with this process. So the NIST standard is one. Another one is something called the SANS Institute Top 20 Controls uh, which again is, is pretty simple but most companies aren't doing it and it would go a long way if most companies did. Okay. That's a Thank you. Uh, from New Mexico, the, um, the I forget the con and from New Mexico, right? New Mexico standard. So no, SANS S A N S is a. Uh, it's okay. here in the northeast. It, it's here in the, in yeah. Washington. It's no, a okay. it's a not for profit it's, institute, yeah. and it has <coughs> boiled down the top twenty controls that you should have in place for if you're a company. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, over on this side, and we're going to go for about. Ten more minutes, if that's all right. We'll go a little bit long. Okay. I think you've uh, alluded to this already in the discussion of AI, <clears throat> but I wanted to know whether you think that the advent of really working, operating quantum computing would change the balance in one way towards the offense or towards the defense, or would that most likely just be a wash? 
Game but, will be over in 20 years. So I'm not worried about it. Well, um, I love your question because I spent last week trying to write a chapter for a book on that question. Um, I'm still trying to write that chapter. <laughs> uh, so if you know the answer, let me know, and that will make my life easier. Um, from what I can tell, first of all, we, we don't have a workable quantum computer yet, really, despite <coughs> Google saying that they do. I don't think we're there yet. Um, quantum computing is very good for doing some things like factoring, uh, optimization. Uh, it's not a general computer. So can the things that it is good at be applied in the world of cyber? Uh, yes, it can, and un unfortunately, the, the thing that it will be used for first is to break encryption. It's going to be really good at breaking encryption. The 256 um, RSA standards that we're using today uh, are supposed to take 10,000 years to crack uh, using a standard computer today. <coughs> Given the speeds that quantum computing will work at if we ever get it to work, those 10,000 years will be more like a couple of seconds. So most of the old encryption codes, which are the ones that we still use in the commercial world, will be cracked uh, with a quantum computer. That's a problem. Uh, so that's not particularly good news from a cybersecurity perspective. Okay, thank you. It, if you have, if you're the one with, or the only one with a quantum computer, it could get interesting, but I'll, I'll set that aside. Next question, please. Hi, my name's Dave Rogan. I'm the CEO of Deeper Solutions. We help Israeli uh, cybersecurity companies enter the U.S. Mm -hmm. market. Um, I have two questions around process and technology. Uh, the first one around process, there are standards for technology around, you know, this, the, for example, talking about NIST, the cybersecurity framework, and they have um, standards around people in 800 where it really lays out all the roles and responsibilities. What I haven't seen is a good standard around process. What is the standard process for an incident? What's the standard operating mm -hmm. procedure when someone is fished? And I'm just curious if you guys know a framework that is appropriate. And then the second question, real quick, given the speed that corporate America works at, especially when it comes to budget time, budget season, how can these companies take on a new technology? You know, nine months ago, crypto jacking wasn't an issue. These guys don't move fast enough to be able to address those issues. I just say in the, uh, there's no process standards that I've seen yet, but there are great process standards in the physical world. Uh, the DHS has got all this, what's it called, incident command and the whole structure and all that. I've actually done that training myself for physical reasons. And uh, that can be translated. In fact, my little town is working on that right now where I live. We, we have that in place, the physical standards, the ICE, and we're going to do it and for cyber for ourselves too. So maybe it isn't there yet, but it should come soon. Um, that, that's, I, I haven't seen any process standards. I haven't either. Um, uh, I've developed some that I use myself with companies. But what do you do when you realize you're under attack? Uh, but I haven't been able to find any yeah. generally accepted uh, standards. What was your, your second question? Um, how, do cor how does corporate America meet the challenge of having to move fast enough? So uh, corporate America is not bad. The government is terrible um, at, at this issue. So the government budgets two years in advance, basically. I mean, Typically, if, yeah. if you want to buy a widget to solve a current problem, you're going to put it in your budget that, that will deliver money to you uh, so that you can cut a purchase order two years from now. Um, that's been a real problem with keeping up with the threat. In major corporations now in the private sector, I talked about Jamie Dimon uh, and JP Morgan, they now have an unlimited budget uh, uh, at JP Morgan. If they see a new threat emerging and they see a new product emerging, they just buy it. They don't have a budget. Now, not all companies can do that because not all companies get to print money like J.P. Morgan does. But, <laughs> but uh, more and more we're seeing uh, not a fixed budget uh, for cybersecurity and the ability of CISOs to go to a board. CISOs never went to a board meeting until like three or four years ago. Now they're at every board meeting briefing every quarter 
uh, and they can come in at a quarterly board meeting and say, I need more money. There's a new problem. Uh, some companies are good at that, uh, particularly when they have a good guy on the board like Ray. Uh, some companies aren't. Good questions. Thank you. Um, over in this side, please. Elaine Sereo, Associate Rector of WIUU uh, and UACU in Kiev, mm. Ukraine. Mm. Um, I would like to go to the topic that we opened up on on cybersecurity and cyber warfare and to the point of other state actors and the effect that it's had upon us as a nation, the particularly so given the acknowledged um, or rather the recognized aspect of the cyber invasion into the election systems of every single state. And we have to assume that then that's been passed on into other state and then connected into federal government. And we have to also recognize that there's probably malware within that now, which is infecting the whole national governmental system. Do you have any idea what, if anything, is being done? And if so, uh, and if you don't, what would you suggest should be done given that the whole system is infected? We were able to get money out of the Congress uh, on a bipartisan bill this year. Um, I forget the exact amount, but it was, a, it was a significant amount of money to give to state and local governments to improve the security of election uh, departments, election machines and whatnot. People, whenever uh, election voter security comes up, you will hear it's a state and local issue and has to be solved at the state and local um, level. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that the election of federal officials is a state and local issue. In fact, if you read the Constitution, which I urge you to do occasionally, um, <laughs> Uh, it's kind of gone, gone out of fashion in Washington, but, but uh, there's a line in the Constitution <laughs> that says that the Congress uh, may set the time and manner mm -hmm. of election of federal officers, congressmen, senators, president, vice president. Uh, so under the provision of having the Congress set the manner, uh, Congress could set up a procedure where there were federal standards for the security, the cybersecurity of the election of federal officers. We still have uh, states in this country where there's no paper backup on uh, voting machines. Every year we go to Black Hat and DEF CON, these conferences in Las Vegas, and every year somebody demonstrates how easy it is to hack a voting machine. Uh, and when you hear in the media, there's no evidence that any voting machine was hacked, well, all, there's also no, been no attempt to find out. Um, and even if you did attempt to find out, it would be difficult. Uh, so I, I, I am a big believer that until and unless we have secure voting machines, we are at risk. Uh, and if the states won't do it, and there are some states that haven't done it, then the federal government should tell them to do it. I would... But Oh, sorry. I'm just going to pile on the voting machine thing. So the voting machines represent a very large attack surface, mm -hmm. but a smaller attack surface is where the data is kept after the vote. And that's actually more at risk, I think, than the voting machines. In fact, MIT and Harvard do some studies on this. It isn't conclusive because there's a lot of machines to check, but it's the, the, the voter registration on the front end of the vote, the collection of the data. Those databases need to be secure and there needs to be controls put in place to, to Dick's point, but that's a smaller attack surface. That's a manageable attack surface. The, the uh, second part of the question was also the, how do you see this pa as it passes along yeah. Yeah. from the yeah. election uh, structures to the other systems in the states and with the other systems in the states that interact with the federal systems so that you basically have a pass along of the malware from the bottom all the way up? I think that's difficult to do. Um, I don't think those connections exist normally. Um, but there are vital things at the state level. And state governments are not good at this, typically. Some states are. A handful of states I can name that are doing a decent job. 
But if you think about it, the states issued the national ID cards. Uh, we don't have national ID cards in this country, but we really do, and they're called driver's licenses, uh, and they're issued at the state level. Uh, that's one example of a very important function handled at the state level where there's e typically not enough security around those databases. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, and I'm, uh, with, with apologies, I'm going to do one more question, and I'm going to ask if the three individuals standing will come back uh, uh, after we finish here. Uh, we are going to adjourn and go to the next room over. It's, I think it's called the ballroom, where there's a bunch of books. You don't have to buy a book, although you're welcome to. Uh, but if, if you would be willing yeah, to have a conversation sure. with the three who stood up yeah. and, ans and uh, we'll answer those questions so that we finish not as late as we otherwise would. But let's do one last question and then I invite the three of you and indeed invite everyone else to join uh, uh, in the ballroom where the, the books are available. But we will, if you would like to uh, have a conversation See you back, there. Yeah. back there. Okay, um, I'll make this as quick as possible so you can get to the other questions. Um, I'm in the training development sector, mostly online training. Um, cybersecurity has come up with government, private, pretty much any organization I've worked with. And I've developed some very basic training. We're going more in depth with it. It's a very complex topic. And I'm starting to you know, look at where is the best training investment as far as the audience goes. Do you recommend focusing a lot of effort on the end user, meeting all the employees? Or is it better spent with people who have high level access or a mix of that? Do you think online training environments are effective or should there be some in person as well? So that's yeah. two questions. No, I, I, mm -hmm. I think absolutely it's for the everybody. As mm -hmm. Dick said, we need to change the conversation about education. A little company uh, in town here called Cybrary, I'm an investor. They have 1.6 million registered people that train regularly. So these things are popping up everywhere. And uh, it's a good thing. And you should, it's a refresher kind of concept, right? Uh, so I think it's a very good thing. I'm glad to see it. I think you can, online, you, know, you can get a master's degree in uh, yeah. cybersecurity yeah. online from some universities. Well, these credible programs. Uh, I would put the emphasis on training people who are going to run the network and not training employees uh, because no matter how much you train employees, they will screw up. Well, I'm going to end on a more cheery note. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we're, and just to Go ahead. put a bow on it, uh, we all have a responsibility here. Yeah. If these are early days. And uh, we're going to learn a lot as we go down this path. We will win because we always do. <laughs> and uh, but it will not be without a few, a few uh, maybe not so many silver bullets, but a few bullet holes along the way. But we will win because we have to. And I thank you all very much for coming and listening. And happy to take any questions. My email is ray at redseal.net. So get the book, ask me a question, and I thank you very much. Uh, please join us in the ballroom just behind this auditorium, and please uh, join me in thanking Ray and Dick for a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much.